excited here at Lyft about like two or three months ago, and it's been super exciting to, to join the team. There's a lot of momentum, a lot of velocity here, and people are excited um, about data, about open source. Uh, very excited to, to join the team here and, and be part of what we're building at this point in time. Um, before I joined Lyft, I was at Airbnb. That's where I started um, Apache Superset, Apache Airflow. Um, and you know, before then, I was at I was at Facebook working on, on all sorts of data pipelines. I was more playing the role of a data engineer, and that's where I got uh, to play with all the Facebook tools and, and got a lot of inspiration at that point in time to to build what became um, Airflow at the time. Uh, before then, I was at Ubisoft and Yahoo. And the talk tonight about the, the advanced data engineering patterns uh, is really um, made out of examples and patterns that I've observed over the past. Uh, that would be over um, the past like six or seven years while working with my three most recent companies. So uh, what's data engineering? So that's kind of a tough uh, thing to describe. I think data engineering is a lot of different things to different people. Um, about a year ago, I wrote a Medium blog post that's called The Rise of the Data Engineer uh, that, that tried to kind of put a stake in the ground and say like, what is this role? What is it all about? What is it not? How does it relate to um, relative roles like data scientists, uh, more established roles like data scientists or data infrastructure engineers? And how does it relate to in history with like previous roles that existed like business intelligence engineers and uh, data warehouse architects? And uh, so, so to me, like the short description, the long description is you go and you read the blog post if you want to know what I think <laughs> data engineering is all about. Uh, but the short description is the data engineers are the people that are in charge of building the data models, uh, building the data pipelines that will um, organize a company's data and information in a way that it can power the processes, the people uh, in the company. Um, following the, the blog post on, the, on the, the rise of the data engineer, I wrote a blog post that's called uh, the downfall of the data engineer, kind of looking into the, the dark side of um, how hard it is to the challenges around the role and. Uh, what are some of the challenges today uh, if, you're, if you're going to be a data engineer? So check that out. Uh, yeah, and more recently, too, I have another post that's about like, functional data engineering, which is kind of an approach to a certain uh, type of like design patterns for data engineering. Um, so what is Apache Airflow? So I'm not sure. Like, I'll, I will do. I know it's like kind of cliche thing, but how many people are familiar uh, tonight with Apache Airflow? Okay, that's pretty good. It's better than it used to be, you know, a few years back. It's like, I would not even ask the question. Um, so so uh, uh, Apache Airflow is a batch uh, workflow orchestrator. And uh, like the, the short summary of like why, like why do companies need a workflow or orchestrator is that we have more and more people with uh, working with data at, uh, at companies now and that, you know, as you, as you write your, your data processing jobs, uh, there's a lot of like really intricate dependencies that create these really complicated graph of dependencies. So let's say if I load, if I take some data from a source, put it in a table, uh, someone might take this data and derive it further, build a dashboard, write pipeline, denormalize it. So as these processes happen every day of people like uh, the people who work at Lyft or people that work at like basically in any modern company, uh, these like tasks really accumulate. And it becomes like a challenge to, to orchestrate all these tasks. So Airflow is meant to make it easier for people to, uh, to author, manage, and maintain, and, and um, operate like large data pipelines. So uh, a little bit deeper into that. So Airflow is open source. It's under the Apache Software Foundation. So that means like we, have, we use the governance model of the Apache Software Foundation, which is a meritocracy. And that you know really um, allows everyone to get involved. And um, I like to I like to show like I like to say that Airflow is like really important in this world where um, the the data ecosystem is really kind of exploding in a lot of different ways, right? If you think of how many data tools that we're all using, if we were to go and like take a whiteboard and write like what data tools do you use um, every week? we would have a, a whiteboard filled with like hundreds of names, right? So Airflow is a tool that helps you glue all of these processes and things together. Things like TensorFlow, which I, I believe the second talk is about. But uh, so from like 
ML training, to ML scoring, to uh, just data warehousing, to any task that involves uh, data and frameworks, like we need something to glue all of that together. Um, Airflow is also like Python all the way down, so that means the Airflow web server scheduler, the way that you author pipelines is all done in Python. Um, it's it's popular. It's like becoming like kind of almost like it's almost scary how popular it's becoming, uh, and uh, it has an open source like community that's uh, thriving and, and very very active, uh, and it's very uh, expressive and dynamic. So the way that you author an Airflow pipeline, I believe the next slide is like like the very simple. Um, this is an example of what an Airflow pipeline looks like. So Airflow is configuration as code, so that means, um, in, like as opposed to say, a static configuration file, so this allows people to, uh, to manage uh, their, their pipelines as code. Uh, and I'm gonna get into a little bit more, like why is configuration, uh, configuration as code such a powerful uh, construct. But here, you know, if you're familiar with Python, you'll just say that we import a set of classes and objects instantiate a DAG object. So the term DAG stands for directed acyclic graph, which is just a, a fancy uh, word for workflow or <laughs> workflow that have that are directional and that don't have cycles, right? It's uh, acyclic. And in this particular example, we run two bash, uh, bash jobs that do just about nothing, but it gives you an idea of how this all works. Um, in the context of a, in a more real context, you would be probably using uh, something like the Hive operator, uh, something like the Spark operator, and then define your dependencies between these different jobs, and use this script to define the topology of your workflow. So this is what the Airflow uh, UI looks like. So this is a, what we call the graph view. So you're able to visualize all the dependencies between your tasks, uh, what is what has failed, what is running, what is successful, and from here you have access to your logs, uh, to all sorts of context about like in and around your uh, tasks and workflow. This is the the, uh, the tree view, so it's just a tree representation of the same graph that we saw, or a different one. But uh, but here, since we lay it out this way, we're able to see all the different runs. So this would represent the the latest run and everything is green because everything has succeeded and then you see the, the previous runs here. Um, so this is what Airflow kind of roughly looks like. So that was my two minute uh, or maybe five minutes what is Airflow about. All right so now so tonight I'm talking about uh, data engineering patterns. So I want to talk about the, the foundational pattern or like what is common to all the the examples I'm going to dig into a little bit later. So the idea here and what's common about the pattern that I'm talking about is the idea of building um, data pipelines dynamically. So if you're familiar with data warehousing, data warehousing is this idea that you would organize all of your data into a central repository uh, for your organization. So uh, a, a classic data warehouse is pretty static where you would load your dimension tables, you would load your fact tables, and all of these processes, you'd have a task pretty much roughly for every table or so, right? And here we're, we're breaking out of this pattern with Airflow, which is dynamic, and we're starting to build pipelines that uh, read configuration, and we build these pipelines dynamically as opposed to statically. Um, I said I would talk a little bit more about configuration as code. I know that's a big slide with a lot of text here, uh, but Airflow is configuration as code. When you saw that Python script earlier, um, it is a Python script, and as opposed to, say, a JSON file or a YAML file, that means it makes it really natural uh, for people to, uh, to create reusable components. So you can clearly see that you could write a function that returns a set of tasks, or a function or a class that returns a DAG object. And uh, in cases where what you're trying to represent so say in this case, if you have complex workflows, the best way to represent to represent these things is code, right? Because if you were to do it in a static way, uh, the static kind of pattern is, is not powerful enough to represent complex things. And I think like I've made the point before that why do software engineers use code as opposed to say UI where they drag and drop, you know, for loops and, and condition 
uh, the locks, right? It's because like code that is powerful, it's, it's easy to collaborate on. Um, it's, it's natural to put in source control and diff and grow um, over time. Um, so code also, as opposed to a YAML uh, type of approach or a static approach, has a really clear API and we can validate things as uh, things get instantiated. We can define what are the default values for the arguments of a function. Uh, and we can have like just dot string and just a natural API. Um, so the fact that Airflow is also like written um, as configuration as code, it allows people to pass callbacks and, and logic along with uh, their, their topology of their workflow. So an example of that would be, so if I write um, a, a, an Airflow task, I can say, if this task succeeds, I'm gonna pass you an on failure or on success callback, and I want you to run this code uh, if it succeeds, and that could be, say, uh, posting uh, uh, something on Slack or, or whatever, right? It's like infinitely extensible, or infinitely in the realm of Python, I guess. Um, <coughs> So, so there's less stuff that gets uh, that get less in translation. So, so I'm not going to go through all the points here, but the point is configuration as code is more powerful than uh, configuration, good old configuration files. So now the conceptual model I'm talking about, like in the, in the pattern. That, so we're going to get into examples of implementation of this pattern, but now I'm just talking about the high level pattern and what it's about. So. The idea here is that you'd have some sort of abstracted configuration, either in Python, configuration as code, YAML, OCON, uh, or maybe input that can be uh, that can come through a web app. Um, and then you'd have some sort of Airflow script which reads that configuration and based on what it finds would dynamically build a, a, some sort of pipeline or workflow. And this workflow, as it as it's uh, as it's executed. You know, can produce all sorts of summarized derived data. It can pr produce like dashboards and charts, and it can alert uh, people and send notifications. So, uh, one like I think example that a lot of people working at web companies will relate to is this idea of, a, of an A/B testing framework. So, here you can imagine that uh, in a place like Lyft, uh, when we run a new experiment, uh, people will go and input the information about the experiment they're running. So let's say we're trying to change the color of the button uh, to request a ride uh, to uh, to a brighter shade of, of pink. We might give it a, a name to, to this experiment, define you know what's the duration of it, who's the owner, uh, all sorts of like what are the metrics that we want to analyze in the context and the scope of this experiment, and then. You know, there would be an Airflow script that will read the configuration of all of these experiments and all these metrics and nest, um, build some sort of uh, a weave, a, a workflow of dependency based on the input of the user. And this workflow, as it executes, right, it will wait for the source data, pr process all the metrics, process all the experiments. And uh, what will come out of it is a set of computed metrics that might have like p-value and, and confidence in Airflow. Uh, and these, uh, the metric that got computed, computed can uh, can be uh, exposed in, in, in the UI, so say in an A-B testing uh, UI, where you can consume that stuff. Cool, so that was like the description of the, the pattern, and I'm gonna get into like implementations or, or places, like some examples that over the past years I've seen uh, some of these, uh, like so, some of these, uh, dynamic pipelines emerge. So the first example is like super, super simple. Um, and it's something that uh, we built at Airbnb that's called Autodag. And the use case here is, you know, there's a lot of people that run SQL, uh, you know, so there's analysts and, and data scientists that might be running little pieces of the SQL and they just want to schedule that to run every day. Uh, it's a fairly common use case and these people might not want to go and author a pipeline and set up a development environment. So, at Airbnb, we built this uh, this really simple UI as an Airflow plugin, where people can paste their SQL they want to run every day, give it a target table, and uh, this little UI will validate your SQL. It will introspect your code, figure out what the dependencies for your um, your SQL is, uh, create you know the wait for operator or the the hive partition sensors required to load this data. Uh, it might like lint your code, give you some advice. 
uh, and it will schedule your workflow and alert on failure. Right, so that's like an extremely, that's probably the, the simplest implementation of, of, of this pattern. And here, like I wanted to show the source code for, uh, for this Autodag thing. So the source code is extremely simple. So my point here is not like, let's read the code together. It's just like, you, you need a simply like a few dozen lines of code to be able to read, say from a database, what are all the, the statements. Uh, that you should schedule and then uh, simply you know instantiate a few tasks cool so now into the second uh, example of this pattern so this uh, this is uh, the use case where you want to compute some some types of metrics over and over so while I was at Facebook at I, I spent over two like two to three years like mostly focusing on uh, data pipelines that would compute engagement and growth accounting metrics so these metrics are uh, very common like, at web companies, and I think I think like engagement and growth is a concern to most industries nowadays. Nowadays, so uh, so engagement metrics are like uh, daily active user, weekly active users, uh, and then computing the number of users that are new, churn, resurrected, uh, stale, and active. So um, the story there is that you know at Facebook we we wrote this pipeline originally for the whole site, and then. Uh, and then we started replicating this pattern for different verticals. So say we want to know, we want to do growth accounting and engagement metrics for, for photos, for messaging, uh, for photo uploads, and pretty much for anything you can think of on Facebook, we wanted some sort of fl uh, flavor of this pipeline. And instead of going over and over and writing the same data pi pipeline, uh, we decided to build some piece of machinery that would take some user input, saying like, I want to apply this pattern to my data, and based on their input parameters, we build a pipeline on their behalf um, automatically. Uh, so this is what uh, the, the config file input may look like for something like that. So in this case, we're using a, a YAML input. And let's say I'm at, uh, I'm at Facebook and I would like to, or this, in this case, I'm at Airbnb and I want to uh, get a bunch of uh, engagement and growth accounting metrics around host and guest interactions. Uh, I would have to fill in the specific, uh, you know, config files, file with like where my input might be a specific data set where I put in my subject, in this case that's a host ID, and my set of dimensions and metrics as a map. So this is like, you know, what the framework expects as an input. And then I can say, I'm interested in getting my, you know, daily active users, my monthly active users, my 56 days, you know, active users, I'm interested in these dimensions that I'm providing, and here, uh, I'm interested in this specific demographics and these metrics. Uh, I want to summarize the long tail. So you, so you do a whole order of like what is the pipeline that you want generated for you, and this framework's going to re read this config file and go and build an extremely complicated pipeline on your behalf. Uh, and all all you have to do is to provide this input. So what's happening behind the scene here? So, um, so the, the Python script like, translates uh, this input into a complex workflow uh, that's issued for every agent. So we look at one YAML file, that you can imagine there would be dozens and dozens of instances of this different flavor of this YAML file. Um, this framework will go and run all sorts of queries and cube the data uh, and by cubing, I mean running different sets of group eyes, different sets of count distinct, so it will, it will run all sorts of computation. It might be able to run a backfill on your behalf, right? So if you put in a start date, you're like, I want this data since you know, January of last year. Um, based on this input, the framework knows that it needs to backfill this data for you. Um, it can also like leave a computational trail behind for deeper analysis. So that means that as we compute all these engagement and growth accounting metrics, we can leave behind um, you know, tables that are useful to do things like segmentation or cohort analysis. Uh, it runs optimized logic, and that sounds like, that, that sounds like, you know, why, why would it not? But like, the idea is like, if you're building the same pipeline over and over, um, some of them are gonna be a more recent version, and some of them an older version, and they're not gonna be optimized. So here, now that we have all this, um, all of this computation or framework in one place, we can improve one and improve all of them at once. Um, and yeah, here I was talking about more advanced use case, so this particular framework is able to 
kind of the long tail of high cardinality dimension, and that might matter a lot in a context where you're trying to aggregate the data, right? So instead of like spending a lot of time writing complex queries that do this, you just say, here's my parameter, and here, here's what I want, and the framework does it kind of magically for you. Um, some of the ideas about uh, like around that too, so that the framework knowing everything it knows about your dimensions and metrics, in theory, is able to craft uh, some sort of a dashboard for you on your behalf without you having to actually build the dashboard. Um, so next example, uh, so I'm going to do a deeper dive into experimentation, and this is largely uh, based on, on uh, like how it's done at Airbnb uh, using Airflow. So first, like talking about the scale of experimentation at Airbnb, so this is pretty old already, this is a talk, or this is a slide from last year, but at the time they were running uh, a few hundred experiments and they were running uh, they added, so this represents the number of metrics that uh, are used at Airbnb. So when you run an experiment at Airbnb, you can say, I'm going to pick the, these core metrics, these sets of <laughs> metrics, and, and perhaps some metrics that are very specific to your experiment. So, you, so this is like just an idea of the scale in places uh, like, like Facebook or, or other, other companies. Like they run you know, thousands and thousands of experiments at, at any point in time and they compute all sorts of metrics. So here we're looking at the workflow that comes out uh, of experimentation um, at Airbnb. So here we're, we're showing that this is like a, a, about a third of uh, the, what the workflow looks like. So each one of these are individual tasks and you can imagine that you know, these are individual experiments and they, you know, they're nested in a very complicated way. Um, there's this feature in Airflow where you can click on a task and say, I, I will only want to see the tasks that are related to this specific task. And that's what we're looking at here. So we're looking at, say, a specific experiment. And the, the general workflow is you would wait for the source data to land, right? So for your metrics to land in your data warehouse. Once you have the source data, you would load these, uh, these metrics into your, your metrics repository. Um, so I guess like metrics repository, could, like, I could do probably uh, a talk just on what a metric repository is or might be. But the idea, we load these metrics into a centralized place. And then we compute the atomic data for uh, the specific experiment. We aggregate the metrics uh, where we compute all sorts of stats. So again, like the confidence interval, p-value, uh, that sort of stuff. And we export the summary uh, to MySQL in the end where the experimentation UI can, can uh, surface that data. So um, at Airbnb, if you want to uh, create a new metric where uh, that becomes viable for people to use in their experiment, so in this case, we're looking at something called customer ticket open, right? So that means it's an event where someone opens a ticket, uh, you know, so customer experience type ticket. Someone owns this metric. Uh, we know that the subject is user, so there's different types of experiments that may take place. Some of them might be user-centric, cookie-centric, uh, you know, it could be host centric, and, and or say at Lyft, it could be you know driver centric or passenger centric. Uh, so this metric is very simple. We source from a certain table, so it's defined as SQL code. Uh, we define the dependencies, and that's basically how you would add a new metric into the system. And I believe I showed I showed a little bit of this uh, screenshot before. So as you create a new experiment, you would go into this UI and put all the information about your experiment. With all this information, we're able to build this, this very complex pipeline uh, on, on the behalf of the, the user. So this is what the, or my like simplified interpretation of what the database schema might look like behind the scene, or some of the steps here. But the idea is that we have this metrics repository that stores uh, metrics per user ID or per subject uh, with a dimension map, an event name, and a value. So this very like skinny table with a lot of rows. Uh, here we have a table that has all the information about experiment assignment, which user has been exposed to which experiment. And this would be like kind of the final delivery table, probably in MySQL, so we can surface it in the web UI, where we have um, all the statistics aggregated and computed. Um, so, so there's definitely a lot more complexity uh, behind the scenes. So this is like an extreme simplification of what uh, experimentation 
look, may look like you know, at a company, but that might be the, the first version that you would deliver, would be something like what I described. Beyond that, there's a lot of challenges, things like uh, cookie to user ID mapping, um, you know, can be, it's, it's uh, data that is kind of mutating by nature, so you might have to like, kind of backfill things uh, periodically, um, that, that sort of things. Um, there's also uh, event level attributes, which you call like kind of tact attributes, where uh, you might want, might be interested in, in being able to uh, drill down into your experiment. So if you're looking at a metric, you might want to see it by country, by you know, by gender, uh, by region, and things like that. So uh, this whole dimensionality thing can become pretty complicated. There's different types of subject. Uh, there's also different types of experiments. Uh, things like an email experiment, where you'd be sending different, slightly different email to different people. Look at their click-through rates. Um, there's, there's like statistical things that are beyond uh, my personal understanding of statistics, like trying to, like beyond p-values and confidence interval, you see like what is the, the real meaning or interpretation of, of these statistics. And there's like trying to understand like the global impact, like if you were to launch this experiment, that might have been, uh, you know, you, you might launch an experiment against like 1% or 10% of your user base, uh, trying to figure out if I if I launch that to every to everyone with network effects and things like that, how will it um, affect like my metrics? Hmm. Cool. So this is uh, so now I'm looking at like a different use cases for this. So something that we've seen rising in a lot of uh, companies that uh, do ML, and I think like everyone is doing ML to to a certain point uh, these days, or at least everyone is trying. Uh, I think I think like there's a like varying degree of maturity there, but like one thing that we see emerging is this need for uh, an ML feature repository. The feature repository is a place in, in your company, uh, the same way that you would think like your data warehouse is the center of all the data useful to your company and where you want to store it. The ML feature repository is where you put all your entity-centric metrics uh, that you might need to use or that are useful to train your machine learning models. By entity centric, I would mean I mean something like if you have a lot of like driver or rider metric, uh, and that you want to use across different machine learning models instead of like reinventing the wheel every time you want to train a model, you want to centralize all this information so it can be used uh, across your your ML, and so this way you can have some sort of like consistent reproducibility, and you can know this model has been trained with a specific version of these data sets. Um, you know, so it brings it brings a lot of, of clarity and a lot of like kind of governance to, to uh, the centralization to to that specific problem. And it can do things like uh, so. Something that's really common in ML is to do all the the time windowing. So things like understanding light to life to date metrics, or say uh, for a user, it might be something that might be very predictive of say a user behavior might be like how many how many times over the past seven days or 28 days did a user perform a certain action. So a framework like this, you can imagine here I'm not showing like a YAML file, but you can imagine that you would define a metric. And you might define what are the time windows for that metric that might be interesting, and the framework will go and compute that stuff for you, right? Um, and of course, like this thing, so you can imagine that you would have some sort of hooks to make it easy to, uh, not like out of the metrics repository, being able to uh, to train your models and to uh, to use these models to score um, score data. Cool. So this one uh, is called Stats Demon, which is a pattern I've seen at a few companies, and I think it's some something uh, pretty interesting. So it, it's the idea of um, computing database statistics. Um, on top of your data warehouse. So I think historically people that like know about like uh, more like classic RDBMS or old databases, or I would say old, but things like MySQL, Postgres, um, Oracle, right, like will compute all sorts of statistics and store them inside the database uh, like metadata schema so that the, the, the query optimizer can use that metadata to come up with good plans. And turns out things like like Presto and Hive are not really good at computing their stats, right? They kind of do it at runtime. Uh, but and it also turns out that these statistics are really useful for people working with data. Um, so 
So it makes a lot of sense to monitor your data warehouse and perhaps compute statistics. So this specific framework I'm talking about is something that was built uh, at Airbnb. And the idea is like we'd be monitoring the meta store. So that's like the, the metadata repository for um, Hive. And every time we'd see that a partition has been loaded or has changed, we would, uh, we would notice that, and this little daemon would, uh, would generate a query dynamically to figure out, say for numeric columns, what is the, the min, max, average, sum, null count. And for a string, we might be interested in what is the count distinct, uh, what is the sum of the number of characters in this column. So as, as, we, uh, as we load more data, as the data gets mutated in the warehouse, we compute all these statistics and make them viable for people to use. And we store them in a smaller place, like a like a MySQL database where we can really easily see our row count over time, where we can see, uh, say, the distinct count of a specific column um, evolving over time. And that turns out to be really useful for capacity planning, uh, data quality monitoring, and all sorts of, of debugging, right? So if you're, if you're a data engineer, it's really useful to have statistics on the, at your fingertips as opposed to having to run large big data jobs to figure out you know what your data is is looking like um, so yeah it's very very useful to for uh, anomaly detection and that sort of stuff um, so here so that was uh, the last kind of formal example and like before I got wanted to give like a, a set of other uh, places that, that are other areas with this, this kind of pattern of building dynamic uh, pipelines has been observed uh, so for things like anomaly detection, that would be largely configuration driven, right? You can imagine that if you need batch uh, anomaly detection, this would work kind of very naturally for, for that kind of use cases. Um, things for like uh, production MySQL exports or scrapes, right? So if you have an array of MySQL databases, right? You, you're an uh, Amazon shop, you use a bunch of RDS databases, you want to get this data into your warehouse. Uh, you can imagine that you would have a small framework where you put the list of all your connection strings and the frequency at which you want this scrape and this thing would just uh, do, do all the work so that when you want to add a new database, you just add an entry to that configuration files and everything uh, flows like easily. Um, <clears throat> something uh, something we've built in the past too uh, is uh, a framework to make it easy to load data into Druid.io, which is this cool uh, database that's like an in-memory column store that's really fast. Uh, so, you know, to make it easier to load data into this database, you know, having a little bit of a framework can be useful. Uh, things like email, uh, email targeting rule engine, so you might want to do analytics on your data, figure out who are all the customers that have not, you know, taken a lift ride over the past seven days, but have not received an, a marketing email over the past three days, and like have some sort of very complex rules to figure out who should get uh, what email. Right, so you could have you could specify someone could specify their rules, and this framework would proceed and, and just kind of do the right thing. Uh, things like cohort analysis, user segmentation. So that's that's uh, an area where there's a lot of complexity to it and potential automation. And you know, so so you can kind of imagine too that like if you're a data engineer, if you're working with data, there are like things, there are patterns that you might see emerge in your environment, and these patterns. Uh, Knowing that you're able to, to write dynamic pipeline, you might be able to find your own uh, place where you can apply this pattern. Cool, so like in retrospect, so that's my conclusion here. Uh, the idea here is metadata engineering. So as opposed to like writing static pipelines over and over, or instead of like building physically pipelines, you can build like machinery. So you can be an engineer like working on the machinery that lays the pipeline, right? And data engineering can be pretty repetitive. It can be, you know, uh, you know, if if you find your job repetitive, that some, sometimes indicates you can work you can work at a higher level and build meta things, and that those problems tend to be a lot more uh, interesting. So, uh, so I encourage you that if, for the data engineers in the room to like notice the pattern and then try to see like what is it that I can automate out of my work and where can I build. Uh, a framework that, that would help me. So, uh, so this is my talk. Um, so check out if you're interested in, in you know, some of the topics we've uh, touched here today. Uh, check out my Medium. Uh, I've got a few blog posts on Medium that might be of interest to you. So thank you, everyone.
we have any questions? Or should I, uh, maybe I'll repeat the question in the microphone. Well, my shirt, oh, so my airflow shirt. So I think I'm, you're the fourth person asking me uh, today. So we, we uh, I did a batch of these t-shirts uh, like two years ago. Uh, but uh, there, there's this company called Teespring. They actually are a, an Airflow user, so this company uses Airflow. <laughs> and they're like a Kickstarter for T-shirt projects. So I might just do a batch and send it to the mailing list. So check out the, the Airflow Apache mailing list. Maybe I'll send the link uh, over the next few days. And if there's not enough, we, they just don't print it, right? So they, they need to like break uh, a certain number, and then they print it for people. Max, is there any more info on that stat statement that you mentioned? Yeah, so, stat, so that stat statement is, is not open source. It's something that you know is super useful, and I think someone should open source it. Uh, when I originally open sourced Airflow, I thought the community would start uh, open sourcing higher level constructs on top of Airflow. Uh, but that never happened. I think it's just like, like the the lack of, of like following through. It's not that people don't want to open source, but it's just like it might be a little complicated to do it. Um, I would really encourage if someone is interested in that. It's really not that hard to build. Like you you just monitor the meta store, uh, ask the meta store for the schema of the table, and ask some sort of rule engine to build SQL dynamically. For in our case, we. Uh, we we use Presto as the engine to scan a partition and then store the the, the result kind of pivot the result so write one bar square with a lot of columns pivot that and attach it to the partition in a very like a uh, in a skinny table. So following up on that one, because some file formats like ORC um, they'll, they'll have like those statistics baked in there the query plan can use it. So it sounds like. You may have just answered the question, but you'll actually generate the SQL to take advantage of those stats. Is that what you were saying? Right. So in the case at Airbnb, we were using the Presto engine and running actual like SQL expression against the partition. But it would make a lot of sense to, to have some sort of a different approach, like you're suggesting, it would be to look at the, the Parquet header file. That would be a lot cheaper. You wouldn't have to actually re read the data. Uh, the thing, though, with SQL, you can do things like approximate count this thing, maybe that that might be easier and also, like, I think it can be kind of the, the approach with Parquet. You might have multiple Parquet files in a partition, so you'd have to somehow merge uh, like the header information. <coughs> Google recently uh, published an uh, open source uh, co uh, project called Facet, in which they're uh, using dependence and gave it that statistic as well. Yeah, so Facet is super cool. Check out uh, Google's Facet. It's not like a Google project, and it's kind of hard to install because they use a uh, their, their build engine, so you know you can't just use npm to get it to work somehow. But uh, it's a really cool project. I was looking into uh, integrating it and exposing it inside Superset. So yeah, so this project is like you load a data, like a ML type data set, and it will do all sorts of like histograms and like really help you profile and visualize uh, your your data set and explore it. Hi, I'm with Cube is a data consulting firm and. Some of the patterns you you talk about, we see a lot with our customers. Well, I have to say about half or three quarters of our customers use Airflow. But in, like for example, the auto DAG is a very very common pattern. And, and is there any plan to have that part of the like the Airflow open source? Uh, yeah, so, so the, we've been like, there's no auto DAG here at Lyft, so, and people are really interested in, in adding a way to schedule their pipelines uh, easily. Uh, and I wrote an internal proposal to do a little project where, uh, you know, so, so with Apache Superset, we have a SQL IDE, which is the natural place to like write your SQL and iterate on it. And I wanted to add an option to schedule your pipeline or, or schedule your SQL out of SQL Lab in Superset. And since Superset is not a workflow engine or it's not a scheduler, the idea is that Superset would expose an endpoint where Airflow could call this endpoint, get the configuration of all the queries to run, and build a pipeline out of it. So um, if we do it, like it will certainly be, uh, be open source and probably broadcasted to both communities. So that, that, that might come out over the next like half or so at some point. Have you seen Airflow being used for uh, more <coughs> incremental pipelines rather than sort of badge pipelines uh, that are like Table scans instead of 
So you're, you're thinking like streaming, by incremental you mean more streaming? Yeah, so in order to sort of like, instead of recomputing over the entire table, just recomputing what has changed. Uh, yeah, 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 so recently like I wrote this blog post that's called Functional Data Engineering, and it's about applying the, the, the concepts of functional programming to data engineering. And the concepts are around uh, like treating uh, partitions as immutable data blocks using pure tasks that don't have side effects. But I think a, a, an assumption, you know, the best practice in data engineering is to not recompute um, anything or to do as little recomputation as possible. So I would assume, say, most fact tables, would, you would only process the events for that have occurred since the last batch. Now as to whether Airflow is the proper place to do uh, streaming, streaming which is a different topic, where there's incremental means you don't reprocess stuff you've already processed. And if you, if you look at uh, what streaming means, it means more like the, there's either the notion of micro batches or like, like you know, the, the rows are flowing through the system. And Airflow really is, is about batch processing and it's hard, you know, it's like it was built assuming that everything runs on a schedule uh, and gets instantiated uh, periodically or on demand. And uh, I think people have, have used Airflow to run streaming jobs at Airbnb just because like we were good, we had like good Airflow infrastructure. We would spin up Spark streaming job using the Airflow engine uh, because in like kind of abusing Airflow and using it as other people might use Yarn or things like Kubernetes, but that's not like a use case we designed for. Uh, it's just kind of something that since you have all these workers and this scheduler you might be able to use it to do that but we don't recommend typically uh, using that as far as streaming goes if you if really you're looking at anything uh, where you want a latency of less than like 5 10 or 15 minutes uh, so airflow is really great for like d daily batch jobs hourly batch jobs maybe some things that might need to run every five minutes but if you're looking anywhere smaller than that like there's some much better frameworks for that I admit uh, we use Flink. Uh, for that kind of purpose. A lot of people use Spark Streaming, Kafka Stream, um, you know, uh, Dataflow or Apache Beam. So there's a lot of solutions there that are, like, like the, the framework is built in a way that you're, you're assuming you're streaming rows. Last question for Max. Okay, all right. All right, thank you, Max. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. in the big data space, having worked at Flutter and currently at Confluent. Uh, Gwen is also the author of two books in the